Yeah. We're live, so um, welcome to the Project Nerdy live show to discuss Mockingjay Part 1. Um, what kitties? I guess we introduce themselves. <laughs> uh, this is Holly, woo. It's Kat and Kona. Yeah. Holly won't stay. Aww. Yep. She doesn't like that. <laughs> Damn or shy. Well, if you haven't seen the movie yet, uh, don't worry, because the first part of the show, we're not going to get into any spoilers, and when we start discussing that, we'll um, let you know so you can leave the show at that time and then come back and rewatch once you um, have actually watched the movie. Um, so first off, um, did y'all want to talk about any non-spoiler stuff of the movie first, or talk about me and being an extra first? Let's talk about you being an extra, because I think we could do that without being too spoilery. Okay. Maybe. Yeah, I thought you didn't do it. But then yeah, you're like, oh yeah, but I did it. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, I can get into that. Um, so basically um, what happened, um, uh, if, you, if you're not familiar, George is now like the third or fourth biggest state in the country in regard to filming movies. Uh, it's huge. So um, the past few years it's really taken off. In fact, it's got to the point now where they're building massive film studios here and stuff. So it's more of a permanent industry. Um, so because of that, uh, the local newspaper in Atlanta, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, they have set up like a entertainment blog to kind of talk about, you know, seeing the stars in Atlanta, stuff like that. But they also constantly post um, stuff for the movies they're filming here. They're looking for extras. And so that's how um, I found out about the opportunity. I've never really been interested in doing that. I never really was in a drama or acting, anything like that. But when I saw they were looking for Hunger Games stuff, I thought, well, that's cool, because I love the book. And the description of what they were looking for matched me pretty perfect. They were looking for uh, slender men and women in their teens or 20s, no tan, no tattoos visible, that type of stuff. Um, you know, close, you know, cut hair, that type of stuff. So it, everything they were looking for fit me. So I... I'm more just applied because I thought it would be neat to apply, and I could say, "Hey, I applied, but I really think I'd get it." So I sent an email while I was at work, right when I got to the office, and literally that afternoon, I got a call on my cell phone and basically asked if I could come down to Atlanta, like as soon as I possibly could, for a costume fitting. Yeah. So I told them, like, "Well, I can't leave work." I said, "Can I come after 5 p.m.?" And they said, "All right." Um, so it turns out when I actually got to the film studio, um, they were actually just waiting for me, um, which I don't think people were happy because they'd already been up apparently since like 2 or 3 o'clock that morning. Um, so they'd turned um, the Hunger Games, since they were filming both parts, I'm sure that's why they had such a big setup, they'd film stage just into their costume department. So you got there, uh, they took your measurements real quick, and then they took you um, back, did a quick try-on costume. Um, and I should say before I get too far, I was uh, one of the citizens of District 13. So basically my uh, costume was fairly simple. It was like overalls with real basic boots, nothing too standard. So they did quick that. Um, I was lucky I actually got in because apparently um, the I got the last pair of boots in my size. <laughs> A little bit bigger, I would have got it. Um, and apparently, they were European size shoes either, so I guess they'd imp imported them somewhere from Europe. I don't know why, but um, so got fitted for a costume that worked, and then they immediately cut my hair. Um, one of the things in the extra column that they you know, a buzz cut, so you had to be willing to have your hair cut. So they immediately sent me back to the barber, which he wasn't happy because he was supposed to have left like an hour ago. So he was having to stick around. So the entire time he was cutting my hair, he was getting calls from his friends about why he hasn't picked them up yet and that <laughs> type of stuff. You're like, awkward. <laughs> so I cut my hair real quick, and then they um, had to take photos, all this various different angles. So then when filming started, they could match the photos up with my hair and then recut the hair at that time to know what they looked like. Because um, obviously this might happen over a couple months, and they need the hair to look similar the entire time. Um, then they came out and took photos hair with costume. Um, this is the only thing I really don't know what meant uh, what it meant. Um, the guy who was in charge of 
the costumes came over while they were taking my photos and asked what they were had planned for me. So they said, well, whatever their classification for what kind of citizen I was. And then he looked, he made me move my head like this, and he got real close, and he looked at my hair and stuff, and he goes, he might work for this. And he kind of thought about it. He's like, no, never mind. So I don't know what part they were thinking about. Huh. The only thing I could think of is um, for some of the um, citizens of District 13, they got tattoos on their arm, um, which they never showed this in the oh. movie um, from what I saw. So I don't know if they'll do this in part two, but it's supposed to be there was, like when you were walking around, um, District 13 was so regulated there's a that schedule on your you arm. Scan, yeah, your schedule was scanned in, and they'd have to scan it. Cool. So film some stuff with the extras having that scanned, but obviously they didn't put that tattoo on everybody. So I wonder if maybe they were thinking of doing that. That was my only guess, because that was really the only specialized worker. The other Did part. Look in your work. face to see. Um, well, I don't, because they did. I think. Those people were getting more close-ups because hmm. they'd have to show us. I don't know if that was what they were looking for. I have that. I really don't know. The yeah, well, I can think that. on a non-spoilery thing where there are less, where there's like the main cast and then um, workers in the background in where it wouldn't, you wouldn't have been a face in the crowd. It would have been like you'd be sitting at a table doing something. Yeah, and that's one thing I've uh, found interesting. Um, all right, so I'll get to that part in a second. So first I'll tell you why. I almost didn't do it, and then I did do it. Um, so the first, um, when they first booked me, they basically told me there was about 20 possible filming dates. They didn't know when. And the first date, for a variety of reasons, is not did not work out. Um, it just wasn't really possible. It, they were filming way in South Georgia, so it was like a four or five hour drive. It was real short notice. Um, so I basically told them I couldn't, I couldn't do it. And in the instruction they give you, they basically lay down all these frets. Like if you back out, they're going to blacklist you. If you do anything on set, you're not supposed to like bring a phone with a camera or try to take a picture while you're on set or anything like that, or if they catch you leaking stuff on social media about what you see on set, they'll blacklist you. So all this type of stuff. So I assumed since I missed the first day that I was just done. You know, they didn't want me back. Um, then like a month later they emailed me and said, hey, we want you all to, you to film these two days. Um, can you be this, the first period of filming? Does that mean I'm still eligible? And they said, yeah, you're still eligible. But I think they were so desperate for extras because um, District 13 had huge crowd scenes and they needed a lot of people. So I, I think they did a lot of stuff at scare tactics to try to keep you in line, but they weren't really that serious about it. Like if you missed a day, you could still come and film. That makes sense. Um, so I ended up in film for a couple days in December. Um, so the scenes I were in were... Um, uh, the scenes, what they called that day the core. Um, so basically the two scenes, um, one we shot a half a day, which um, is when Jennifer Lawrence is coming down the elevator with the security chief guy, which I can't really think of his name. All right, you know, they get to the bottom of the elevator and they just walk across a little people walking around. Mm, and, yeah. Yeah, we filmed that for like eight hours. <laughs> Because how the elevator worked, uh, it was actually like on a low um, forklift, basically, that was like two stories high. So the forklift would lower the elevator, the door would open, they would walk, we would walk in the background, they'd stop, reset, and just do that over and over and over again and film it from every single possible angle you could think of. In some of the scenes, they had her doing dialogue, other ones they didn't. Hmm. I think in the version they showed in the movie, she's not speaking. So I think they went for the non-dialogue stuff. Um, so that was, like I said, nearly a half a day there. The other scene I filmed um, was uh, the speech that uh, Julianne Moore 
gives uh, about the deal she struck with Captain. And the, the victor's uh, immunity. When everyone is pissed off. Yeah. So that took forever because they feel... So one, even though there were a couple hundred extras there, there weren't enough to do on the floor. And if you notice when they're, she's doing that speech, there's also balconies. Yeah. The balconies are, we, are, are real. They're really there. They weren't, oh, I figured it was CGI. No, they're real. Um, but they didn't have enough extras to have people on the floor and the balconies at the same time. So they had to film the scene first with extras on the bal the ground floor, and then the extras were then moved up to the balconies. And then oh. so Julianne Moore had to give that speech over and over and over again. And there were sometimes they were able to film without her giving the speech, just us doing reaction stuff. So did you guys get to like boo and stuff? Yeah, we got to uh, <laughs> when the movie um, um, they kind of changed the sound fix. They were at, we actually just were told to hiss. Hmm. It's weird. So it was like you know. <laughs> wanted to use that for a base, and they went in later with special effects and, you know, ramped it up. Oh, uh, that's so weird. So, um, the thing I was going to say, Kat, you know how you said, you know, there were people in the background that had more close-ups? So there were a few times when they were filming, I mean, the reason it took so long, they filmed everything from every single possible angle. So, like, uh, when Katniss is talking to her sister about when they she first says, the, you know, President says the thing about the author, and she goes over to talk to Finnick, and she just says like a couple words to her sister. They filmed that that couple lines of dialogue from every single possible angle. So some there were extras very much in the background, other ones we were just a blur. They were really not picky who was right behind them. They just had us in sections, and they just kind of moved you around, and you were just there. Um, so for that one, I was Lily, and that that's the one to see myself. I think there's a few of the scenes I'm pretty positive. If I pause, I'll be able to see myself on DVD, but yeah. theater just moved by too quick. But the scene where she's talking to her sister, I was literally like three people behind her. Wow. So was, you think you'd stand out. You're so tall. <laughs> I, was, I was pretty close behind her. Um, uh, so during that scene, I saw her, obviously, the actress who plays her sister, um, saw Finnick, um, the actor who plays him, um, and then Julianna Moore a lot. Um, the biggest things, like Jennifer, she, she looked a lot shorter in person. I think a huge reason for that, the costume she is wearing was the same as mine, is like just regular boots with no heels. I think most time you see her on TV and stuff, she has these high heels on, so she just naturally looks taller. Um, so that threw me off a lot. When you first see her, I think I'll say they were all super nice. They were very friendly. The cast members seemed to be getting along really well. They were joking along. They were texting each other, that type of stuff. So that was, it was really cool, that aspect of them. Um, she did stand right behind me. And the, I can't think of the actress who plays her sister's name. Um, I mean, Lily right behind me. They were the people right behind me at one point. Um, at one point, they changed where she was supposed to stand, and she didn't notice, so she went to her old spot. So even though the extras had moved up, she went to her old spot. So that's how she ended up right behind me. <laughs> They'd actually filmed that part. She just stood there for about a minute before they came over and got her. Um, so I'd, she did brush up against me as she walked by, so that's <laughs> claim of fame, you know. <laughs> Jennifer Lawrence almost kind of touched me yeah. on accident. <laughs> the no, None of that. Extras really got to talk to her. That's where um, when they gave your instructions, um, they said, we realize you want to look at the stars, but, you know, try not to stare and be creepy and that type of stuff. And then they said, you're not allowed to talk to them unless they talk to you first. <laughs> so, and it makes sense because like that one, there's two yeah. or three hundred extras. So if every time, you know, somebody tried to say, hey, and introduce, it would just kill filming. Yeah, uh, very true. I mean, it makes sense, and most of the time when she wasn't filming in break, they just popped out their phone and started looking at stuff. So you could tell they, did, for the actress, um, actors there, the extras really weren't there. They were just you know they really were just background scenery. They just, you know, it, I'm sure they're so used to be filming around people that it just you're just in the background. They don't really notice you. Still so cool though. It was still awesome. Uh, 
so I guess the less than glamorous parts about doing it are um, so the the days I did it. Um, so I live about an hour north of Atlanta. They were filming a couple hours south of Atlanta in a warehouse, a abandoned warehouse, in um, a small bur suburban city that they built the core in. It was just an empty warehouse that they had enough room to build all that. Wow. Uh, about a three hour drive. You had to be um, at the extra parking lot by 4:30 a.m. So I, you know, left my house like at 1:30 in the morning to do the three hour drive down there. Because they warn you, you know, you, you have to be here by 5 a.m., 4.30 to 5 in that time range. If you're there at 5.01, we're, you're, it's too late. Hmm. We ended up, they were super late. So they had us park at a mall, like behind the mall, because they didn't want the extras parking on set. So just milling around the parking lot waiting for the shuttle buses to get there. The shuttle buses were like 40 minutes late. So we stood in a parking lot for about an hour, freezing, because it was the middle of December during one of the coldest winters in Georgia history, so it was like 20 degrees outside. Then they shuttle you to this abandoned warehouse um, that has no heat in it. Um, you, you weren't, they told you you could wear like an undershirt or something to stay warm, and you know, but they had set socks you were supposed to wear. You really couldn't wear multiple layers underneath because it would bulk up your costume. Um, and like I said, for the guys, we were, and the girls, we were just wearing overalls. So very, very thin. I mean, I would say as thin as a t-shirt. Um, no space heaters, anything like that. And we were there for 15 hours. Um, so the first was um, getting in costume, which is very, very quick. Uh, costume was really, and that's the only souvenir I have from it. So when I did your, when you did your costume fitting, they gave you a, a little ID tag, which, that's, that. Ooh, fancy. So when you. D thirteen zero five three. And the little seashore at the thing, that's the code, for the movie, because, any of the stuff they never said you were filming on the Hunger Games, although everybody knew you were filming on the Hunger Games. Like any of the official emails they sent you or any paperwork, it said like yeah. the unnamed trilogy seashore or something like that. Um, Pretty standard for most yeah, so when you, yeah, when you checked in, you just showed them your card, and then you went to the costume thing, and there was a there would be a bag of clothes that had O fifty three, so that was mine, and you would get changed out really quickly. What took forever the first day was hair because they had to redo everybody's hair. All the female extras had to get their hair braided certain ways. If you notice in District 13, they all had their hair in certain styles. Um, luckily for them, it didn't take as long. For the men, it took longer because we had to get our hair buzzed again. So there was literally like 200 male extras. They had five or six barbers cutting. Um, we were in line for two or three hours getting our hair cut. Wow. Wow. Um, I actually missed a couple hours filming. <laughs> yeah. So the line was so long, at a certain point, the, the, the female extras finished before the male extras. So I was at the middle of the line, and they actually divided the line in half and put the other male extras to the female extra, basically hair trailer, to get their hair shaved. Um, so since I was in the middle, I became at the end of one of the lines. Um, so me and, like, the last ten guys in that line did not get our hair cut in time for the first bit of filming. Um, so that was, they actually filmed on that elevator scene a couple hours before I got to join in. So once they cut our hair and did really basic makeup, they put makeup on it, makeup on to kind of make your skin even look paler. Um, but once they cut your hair, we had to just go to the um, a little tent they'd had set up, and we just had to sit there for a couple hours, just killing time. Um, you know, you're already freezing. Um, the only other extras back there were um, some of the... Um, they had extras from nurses and stuff like that that weren't supposed to be in the big scene, so they were waiting there killing time. Um, so you did that for a while. We were again, freezing cold. Then you filmed for a few hours, and we did a lunch break. I will not say anything. They did have um, good food for lunch. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, had a huge... Huge. Um, the one thing that surprised me on the craft services thing, 
so the the main dish for lunch was pasta with um, marinara marinara sauce. But the thing is, they keep you in costume when you're eating. So everybody was scared to death that you were going to spill sauce on your costume. So it, to me, it didn't make sense. It wasn't a smart idea. Like, hey, let's give the extra spoo that's very easily to spill on your costume and stain it. But I guess they just trusted us to be insanely careful. <laughs> Um, say, so we did a lunch break. In mass is really easy to make and cheap to make versus Probably. something yeah. cleaner. But... Probably. <laughs> yes, yeah, so The lunch break was really the only long break we got. We got about like an hour break, and then we proceeded to film for like ten straight hours. So even though we filmed till nine thirty that night, we never took a break for dinner. Mm -hmm. Uh, at one point, they let us go out and do like a real quick snack for like 10 minutes. We went back in. It was so cold in between filming. Um, there were some of the crew that would go around with those little baggy things you can break and kind of put between your hands to warm them up. So if a certain extra started looking too freezing cold, they would go over there and do that. Your lips would get chapped because it was so cold. So they'd go around with like chapstick, and everybody was having to use the same chapstick. They just would go around, all right, here your lips are too chat, you know. <laughs> yeah, um, please don't. <laughs> yeah. Since it was an abandoned warehouse, you were standing on, um, like, asphalt, concrete huh. the entire time. Um, there were no chairs, so you just, and when you took a bro break from filming, you had to stand in your spot. So you were basically standing and walking on concrete all day. So even though you really weren't doing anything, by the end of the day, you were insanely sore. You were tired. I mean, at that point, by the end of the day, we all the extras have been up for like 20 straight hours. So you just wanted to fall asleep. So in between breaks, you would actually try to sit down on the floor or lean up against the wall or something like that. Um, did they pay you for this? Yes, they, they they did pay you. The standard, I think every movie is a little bit different for the, the Hunger Games. If, if I remember correctly, the standard fee um, rate is like $8 for the first eight or nine hours, and after that, it's time and a half. And basically, there's some people that I talk to that are extras. They kind of do this as a their part-time work now, like they're college students, and they're just extras on movies nonstop. And they say basically all movies, you always get to the time and a half aspect. So the days I filmed, I pretty much got a, like $120 to $140 a day. So, you know, decent amount of money, but it's not like you're going to get rich doing yeah, it. Yeah, still cool, though. I'd I'd volunteer um, to do that for free. So <laughs> the yeah. fact that they pay you is awesome. You got, and that's part of the reason why it took so long too, because when you get there, you have to sign this form. You have to fill out like your W two tax forms and all this stuff. You have to sign a non union waiver form, that type of stuff. Um, and at the end of the day, you have to turn in your pay stub to get your your info, so they know you actually were there the entire day, how much, how many hours to pay, that type of stuff. Um. Part of the reason I have to say why it took so long and there were so many breaks in between filming, I'm not sure if it was just because Jennifer Lawrence had a wig on or if they were the close-ups on her were so close, but every time she did that dialogue with her sister before she walked off, when they reset, they had a hair sauce that would come over and they would had to make sure every strand of hair was the exact same spot. Mm -hmm. So they'd have to pick, and that literally took like two or three minutes every single time. So you just had to sit there and wait until... They'd finish with her, her hairstyle, um, so that drug it out forever. I was actually thinking about her wig the other day. I was trying to figure out if she had worn one on the first Hunger Games, because um, I know she didn't cut she didn't cut her hair really short until after Catching Fire, I think. Yeah, she did cut I it. If it was always a wig, or if it just recently became a wig. Yeah, she that I don't know. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, it was weird. Um, I think that's everybody when you first see her, it kind of throws you off because you're so used to seeing her with different color hair that suddenly when you see her, the really dark hair, it throws you off for a second. Um, so they had to mess with her hair the entire time. So that was um, really slowed down filming. Um, that's pretty standard. The weird, the weird thing was they didn't mess with any of the other actresses' hair like that. So like Juliana Moore, even though she was giving the speech, they never did that with Juliana Moore. They never did it with her sister. It was just when Jennifer Lawrence's stuff. So, which I, it made me wonder, just because it was a wig, if maybe 
the hair moved more on it and they were more concerned about it, or if maybe it was such a close-up of her face that they were more conscious of it because of that. Um, well, every shot but, needs to look like it came from one slice in time. Yes, yep. Um, so I'm trying to... Get, oh, so I did get offers to do more days of filming. Um, some just did not work out on my schedules. So I'm thinking those were the um, days where they filmed, like, where they were doing the speeches towards the end of the movie, where they were doing the happy yells from the crowd and that stuff. I won't say what until later before we get to spoiler stuff. There's also a scene, if you know, with all the extras where they're involved, a stairway in water. Yes. Um, I was offered a chance to film on that. Um, I turned it down because, actually, for that day, you do get water pay. So apparently when there's scenes that involve water, they give you, like, a hazard pay. So you get paid two or three dollars extra. The day they wanted to do that was, um, like, in the middle of January. It was, like, 15 or 20 degrees. And they basically said um, in the email, you'll be in water all day, but you do get to wear a wetsuit underneath your overalls. And I was like, I just do not want to do that. That does not sound like I want to spend 15 hours freezing cold soaked in water. I've got my movie experience. And walking up and down stairs, that's literally what you would have to do. Walk down, run down the stairs, and then run back up them, do it again for 10 hours, and no thanks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that I was, think I would have done that either. <laughs> that was the one day I could have filmed that I just turned down because like, I, I did not want to do that. Um, some of the other people who do this a lot, as extras mentioned, like if you do any scenes where you do remotely stunt-like work, like if you're a scene where you're running or if you had to hold a gun or something like that, you get paid extra for that. Um, and so the, the, rebels, the levels do get paid differently, and I'm not sure how that would be different compared to a smaller budget movie. Like... I'm not sure if Mockingjay could afford to pay all their extras, but if you're on like a movie that might only gross like $40 million, if you're going to have to do that for free or you know what. But for Mockingjay, everybody that was there was getting paid. I remember when That's... they were talking about being extras on like Twilight. They were kids, the kids who went to school with the Collins and Bella, and they casted people out of the nice Walnut and parts of it in the States, but parts of it in Canada, but the ones that were in the States. Oregon, Oregon yeah. So. yeah. And for this one, um, I believe this was the first, of course, the first Hunger Games movie they filmed in North Carolina and some other places. The second one, they filmed part of it in Georgia. Uh, part three and four, I believe they filmed everything in Georgia. Um, so everything you see is, like, when they shoot the mountains, that's the North Georgia mountains, stuff like that. Uh, the Presidential Mansion is a mansion in Atlanta. Um, it's actually part of the Atlanta History Center. Um, so everything that's filmed there so is, you know, Georgia now. So all the extras you see are all people with nice southern accents like me and all that <laughs> sorts of fun stuff. So they're like, don't talk. <laughs> yeah, don't talk. <laughs> yeah. like you're ruining the image of Disney 13, which I yeah. think is supposed to be like in Maine or something. Somewhere yeah. north. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's where it's supposed to be, somewhere like that. Um, I did know somebody else that was like an extra for one of some of the capital scenes in the last movie, so, but, you know, that was... Um, I think they actually got in, but obviously, it depended on what they were looking look-wise. Yeah. Um, oh, the other thing that was of interest, the guy who was actually in charge of the extras for the... I think he was in charge of the extras for the Hunger Games. Um, he was also in charge of... At the same time, they were filming the new Fast and Furious movie... And he was doing something on that movie as well, so he had, had their set, and that was like a week after Paul Walker had died. So the entire time he was on set, all the people were actually talking to him, trying to figure At that point, they didn't know what they were going to do with that movie. So you kind of got behind the scenes stuff with that movie as they were trying to figure it out. That's interesting. Um, I can't really think of anything else related to my experience. Like I said, they wouldn't let you take any pictures on set. Nothing like that. Um, you weren't allowed to take anything um, other than like your little costume tag. So, like I said, you don't really get any souvenirs or anything like that. Um, that you, had, you actually had to turn in your, your cell phones when you got on set, which you completely understand why, because they don't want stuff leaking out. Um, so they, they were super strict about that. 
Well, I would love to move into our spoiler section because I want to talk about the movie. I was just going to say really quick, <laughs> I remember when you were, um, I was living in Nashville up until about a month ago, and Kyle sent me the link to his, um, the entertainment blog when yeah. that was like, if you want to come down, you should. And <laughs> I didn't fit any of the descriptions, and I probably would have made sure it would happen, though, if if any of those listings were for capital people because I so would have been like, screw all of you, I'm going to go be a capital person. The one thing <laughs> that's interesting, um, once you're an extra, you get on their email list, so I get emails every week of them looking for extras. That's awesome. They never put the, never put the names of the movies, so I'm always trying to guess which movies they are because they all have these code names and stuff like that. I have it applied to be a, on any of them um, yet. Um, I figure if I do, I might do it in the next few months. So this one, my work schedule is less busy. Um, other times of the year, it just would be hard for me to take off enough time to do it. But So we'll see. But I, like I said, I more did this one just because I was a Hunger Games person. I never really, really had a desire to do anything acting or extra-wise. So who knows? This might just be a one-time thing for me. But Still pretty cool. Yep. So with that, I guess... Uh, if you haven't seen the movie yet, we'll get into spoilers now, so stop watching and you can come back later. And I'll let uh, either go to whoever wants to start off. Um, my, I, I, the, the thing that I like keep thinking about after just seeing it last night was um, I didn't know Jennifer Lawrence could sing so well. And I was thinking about the Hanging Tree song and how much I really, really liked it and how much I was almost dreading it when I was rereading the book just a few weeks ago. And I was like, because I didn't, I mean, I thought it was an interesting concept and the lyrics were cool. Um, but it just doesn't have the same thing when you don't have, like, a melody to go to it. And so, you know, you'd always just read through it and be like, okay, the Hanging Tree, blah, blah, blah. Interesting story. It's deep and meaningful. And, but then, like, they made it, like, so good. Like, like I was blown away by everything with it because I remember they're sitting by the river or whatever in there and she's like he's like sing a song and she's like and I'm like oh my god I'm like getting ready to cringe <laughs> and it was so good and I was blown away and it was like super emotional and then like they transitioned from her singing into like um, the the dam explosion and I was like this is so awesome and I thought that was like probably the coolest part of the whole movie for me and like the most like emotional part and I just I love it, and I've been like listening to it all day, I'm like a loser. <laughs> it's really good. Yeah, she did. Uh, I really liked that they made it like folky country influence, like so it sounded like it'd been passed down through generations. Mm -hmm. I was gonna say the the one part of that I did find weird is um, I did get thrown off with the the people that were, as they were marching to that were all singing and in unison to the song, so I almost like broke into a mini musical scene for there for a second, so that threw me off for a second, but other than that, I, I was, thought it was a great little segment. It's true, but it, it kind of makes sense. a way to bridge the two ideas, to like really prove to you that the propos were getting out there to the people, that what Katniss yeah. was filming was actually being seen. Yeah, it was awesome. So cool. <laughs> I was just, I was really excited for this because I, um, Catching Fire is my favorite book in the series, and um, when I read Mockingjay for the first time, I I was not impressed by it. Probably because we had two books full of like arena action, and then it was like, okay, like third books are always hard. You either love them or you don't. Um, but I wasn't too impressed with Mockingjay when I first read it, and the second time around, I was a little more impressed, but I was still just kind of like, oh yeah, okay, Mockingjay. I guess they better make it. It's gonna make money. Um, and then I remembered, like, okay, well, we only have Katniss's perspective in Mockingjay. It's all first-person narrative. It's all, I did this, you know. And um, I was like, I really am excited to watch this because they're going to show, hopefully, they'll show all the stuff that you only hear about. Like, um, them breaking in to rescue PETA. Um, with, during that, we just heard Finnick's speech, which was good, but, you know, not that great. But the movie made it so cool, like, how both were happening at the same time and... Um, so what I really liked about the part one was just seeing all of this rebellion and all of this interesting stuff happening that you didn't get to see in the books that you only heard about from Katniss's. Oh, I heard that District 8 had an uprising or, you know, the lumberjacks all dressed in flannel <laughs> had an uprising. But to see it was, like, super awesome. And I was, like, oh, I was super into it. I really, really liked it. Yeah, I did like that part of the 
movie compared to the book. Because one well, big complaint with the book, and I wasn't a huge fan of the book either, was um, I read a lot of military sci-fi stuff. So I read a lot of books that have like battle scenes in it and rebellions and that type of stuff. And one, my one big complaint with the book was it just made it seem like all the districts were able to overthrow and defeat the capital very, very easily. Like once they started, it just you know, there weren't many capital victories in Mocking Day. It's like all the districts just quickly fell out of the rebellion and they quickly, you know, marched to the capital and that type of stuff. The movie they did you know, kind of did a better job of showing, you know, the capital was winning a lot of the time and it made it more of a struggle and seemed like there was more at stake. Where in the book it almost seemed like it was inevitable that the capital was going to fall, you know. Which I think plays to the perspective of Katniss, because she only knows what she's allowed to see, and um, I bet that that what she was allowed to see is that we're winning, and that you're, what you're doing matters, because of the amount of control that Coin had to have on her, even though Katniss is not very controllable, as we find out through the whole series from beginning to end, uh, that even if you do tighten the reins on her, she kind of figures out, or people find, figure out how to get her out of the <laughs> sticky wickets yeah. that she gets into. It's true, it's true. I was going to say, with the Finnick speech, I really like how they cut it together. I think... Like, I liked that it was happening happening simultaneously so that you could really get into, like, this was a stall tactic, that this was a distraction, that this was very, very planned. Um, I just wish, because it was so jarring to jump back between the smooth, silky, like, spilling of the secrets and then into the infiltration scenes, it was very jarring. So I kind of wish that his voiceover would have done the whole thing so that you would have been able to hear his entire speech, which is so good Interesting. In, in, yeah. in plot development and character development. I mean, Finnick is my favorite character above all everybody else. Like, I'm all Katniss and Peeta for the win as a couple and as the protagonist and, like, happy-go-lucky stuff, but Finnick is my favorite character. And... <laughs> because that happens a lot in the series with me. I'm like, Luna! Luna's my favorite character! <laughs> Alice Cullen! She's my favorite character! And, like, Finnick! My favorite character! <laughs> um, I really wish that we would have been able to really hear his yeah. side of the story, because as far as plot, it was really well, because you could see that it was a distraction, you could see that it was a ploy, but for him, uh, when I talked to other people who hadn't read the book, um, he's like, they're like, oh, I didn't really realize what he was talking about. He was prostituted? I was like, yeah. yes, like, this is the big deal, like, to show that the capital is kind of horrid, and not just horrid in this section of, like, killing children, but then, like, keeping you under the thumb for the rest of your life and killing your family horrid, and, and that's so beautiful, and you see why Finnick is the way he is, and you see why all the other, uh, uh, anybody who's desirable or anybody who is still under the thumb of the capital after their victors, like, you see why all these people are the way they are, because this is what they have to deal with ever since their name was pulled and they survive. So I think it, like, gives us wonderful um, depth to all these people who you wouldn't care about otherwise, because you're like, oh, yeah, that's just some jerk trying to kill Katniss again, versus, yeah. no, they're actual real people in this Fictional universe. <laughs> We're dealing with a lot of <laughs> they crap. are real people. They're real people to me. Yeah, that and a good point. Well, I, I saw... really wish that they would have portrayed it a little bit smoother. Just like visually, it was awesome, but like it was really trying to figure out what he's saying. And since it is so important to like the fall of the capital and like spilling all the secrets, like that's the big thing is he collected all the big secrets. So you would have you should have been able to hear the secrets he yeah. was giving you. True. So true. <laughs> I, was gonna say, I, I but, didn't see Finnick in person, so at least on that one day he was a real person. <laughs> very, good point. Good point. Yeah, no, it was a very it was a very good the speech in the book was I mean it, it was a whole chapter. It was mm -hmm. um, devoted to him just, like, spilling these secrets. And even the cat, like, the capital when they're filming it, well, I don't know who this, their names are, I can't remember, but, like, Natalie Drummer, I guess. 
should just say. Cressida. Uh, um, yeah, right, Cressida, thank you. Um, it, when they're filming it, even they're like, oh my god, because they're from the Capitol, and like the secrets that he's spilling are like so insane to them, and like that's, their reaction is so important, you don't even see it. Yeah. At all. Mm-hmm. So, um, and their reaction should reflect how the rest of the Capitol is. And, and they didn't really touch that the Capitol was listening, and I don't know how they were because the power was off, but then the TVs were working. You know what I'm saying? Like, it yeah, was were, broadcasting. They were, they said, yeah, when they said at the beginning, they said, probably nobody will see this, but they'll jam up their, sim- you know, their signals. But it wasn't clear... If nobody could see it, or if some people could see it, or what the deal yeah. was, but I don't know either. But it's still interesting. It should have been. It was good from a movie perspective, but from a character development and from just what the secrets were, they didn't like. If you weren't paying, like the the action of saving Peter was much more interesting to people who haven't read the book than whatever mm-hmm. the fuck Fennec's saying over there. <laughs> like no one even knows. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like exactly. whatever. <laughs> but. Uh. Which is why if they had just had it be a voiceover, like, they could still cut back and forth to him talking, but when they cut to the scenes, like, you still hear his speech over those scenes that I feel like it would have just been less jarring and you would have actually gotten more information across. And since what he was saying was so important to, like, just really sharing how awful the capital is, then... And, And that also gives more sympathies to Coin and sets up Coin for... Like, a, this is the spoiler section. It sets up coin for a greater fall when mm-hmm. when you... Because that was the whole thing with the propos. Like, show how bad the capital is. And if everyone's paying attention to how terrible the capital is and how we're liberating from this terrible construction, then we can slip in with our own military control your lives thing and they'll be too busy being thankful to realize that they're just under a brand new thumb. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, that was one thing I kind of I was a little surprised from at least from part one that they didn't really set up a whole lot that the people in District 13 aren't the best people in the world either. Where like I think in the book, it's been a while since I've reread it, but they dropped a lot of hints early on in the book. Yeah. Compared to the, well, I think by this point in the action in the book, it was already established that the the president of District 13 wasn't the best person in the world either. Where in the movie, they didn't really get into whole, a whole lot with that. So I'm interested to see how much of a villain they make her in the, the next part. I'm assuming they're going to follow through with that part. but Yeah, it'll be like a probably a big big um, betrayal, I'm sure. Because they haven't yeah. set up any negative aspect of her. I mean, a little bit, but they just painted it like, oh, she lost her husband and she lost her daughter, and that's why she's so you know, focused on this one thing. And Katniss is just like, okay. And I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I guess we well, don't. Well, and also they they have the scene where Coin comes out and comforts her while she's waiting for the news, and yeah, which I think is brilliant for the overall character arc of like <laughs> again, look at this snake, look at this snake in snow, and there's also the snake in your room with you. <laughs> yeah, true. Um, it'll because... be very shocking to people who haven't read the book. I think. Um, also, I, I like that, oh, I can't, oh, this is what I say, it was, it's harder, they kind of washed out the part where, because Effie was there, instead of, because in the books, Effie's in the capital almost the whole time, and I really love that they did switch that, and bring Effie into the movie, because she has this wonderful, like, uh, comic relief attached to her yes. permanently <laughs> and she's such a ray of sunshine like even in all of her wigs not being there she yeah. still like exudes so much um when she is there and but from what I I think this I mean tear me apart in the comments or you guys if you remember but I'm pretty sure that the district 13 grabs other parts of her prep team and, like, tortures them yeah. to get them to comply. Yeah, I, I was surprised that wasn't in there. And and I think that part of it was to hold off on how bad 
that, that, that it's just an evil by another name to be under the regime of District 13. Like, I think that Part 1 is supposed to paint the capital so terribly, so of, of a misdirection. Like, while you're focused on, yeah, if you burn, we burn with you, like, yeah, this is a great, like, rebellion, awesome, tear down the system. And, it, like, like the misdirection thing, where if you're so busy worried about this outside threat, you're not really worried about the people who are lording over you now. Yeah. Yeah, Which, I, I forgot about that. We're counting yeah, them. Um, They've been tortured for, like, weeks, and... Yeah. And they Katniss is like, uh, not okay. <laughs> yeah, They're she was like, people not okay. Just because they grew up in the capital. Yeah, and then I think Katniss is thinking too when she goes, how, how, what, if they were doing this right under her nose, what else does she not know about that they're doing? Right. And that was, so, but I think you're right, they're just waiting for part two to show, like, I think the whole point of the Mockingjay, part one and part two, is just going to show, like, war is shitty. And like, mm -hmm. like, like my favorite Sirius Black quote. I think it's Sirius Black, and he says, "The world's not split into good people and Death Eaters. It's not like, or it's not like you know, there's good and bad in everyone. So it'll kind of be like that, where it's like it's not just the capital and everyone else. There's good and bad in, in all that good side, just like District 13. They do good, but you know, there's bad people in there too, and you have to be careful. And also, the scene. I'm really interested in part two when they are kind of wrapping up the decision and they get all of the surviving victors out and they have all the victors meet in a round table to decide whether or not they're going to continue the Hunger Games with the children of the capital. Oh, yeah. As, and um, the, the way that vote swings <laughs> on, on the decision um, that'll be a really interesting scene if they if they include it um, because well, yeah, it does I hope play so. the like circle of evil bully circle. If you're the bullied, then you become the bully. Or um, I can't think of what I was gonna say. Whoops. <laughs> That's a good point, though. I'm very interested to see that as well. I don't know, Mockingjay's just depressing. That whole book's depressing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm curious if they're going to come up with a little bit more of a positive or a happy aspect to end it on. Yeah, probably not. But it didn't that, end happy. That's why you get the that's always, You know, that's always Hollywood's, you know, kind of desire that, especially at the end of a, a series, that they want to have a little ray of hope or some way. And well, it's, it's why they'd it, probably include the epilogue from the book. Yeah, and I can't remember it very well, isn't it? Like, it's like Peta and Katniss. Yeah, they end up together, but like they're never whole again. Like they end up together because no one else has like experienced the things they've experienced, and it's like by default that they can only find comfort in each other or something. It's super depressing. It's like no, th I mean <laughs> they have, they both have a, a level of affection and love. Like what Finnick says, like. When you when you saw Peter die in the thing, I realized that you had a true attachment to him as a person. Yeah. And so, um, it is more. It's not the romantic, tra la la love that is so normally portrayed in fiction. That you know, the let's walk through the meadow and holding hands love. It's more of the connecting on a deeper level love that they are better together than apart because they both are so broken but there is enough there like they truly care for each other as human beings they've been together through so much and that over time they do love each other it's just not it's a more real version of love I guess than what is normally given off in books because in the epilogue, they have two children, a boy and a girl, um, and they're talking about how, or, and Katniss talks about how eventually she's going to have to explain why her parents are so screwed up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and right now they're, and that she and Peta try to live as far as away from the new civilization as possible, because they still both feel that the new civilization isn't even that safe um, yeah. and so yeah it's it's 
it's a happier ending than than the book's tone. <laughs> That's true. That'll be interesting to see. I'm excited. I wish it wasn't coming out like a year from now. They used to do like these part two things like in six months increments, but now you have to wait for the Blu-ray to come out and for it to make revenue. And but I know it's already done filming, and I'm interested too to see what parts um, Phil Philip Seymour Hoffman filmed before his untimely death mm -hmm. and uh, how they're going to work with that. Because I think they said he would he still was they were missing a few scenes with him, but it was going to be doable. They were going to work around it somehow. Yeah, I think it was. They were pretty uh, close to end of filming when he did. And I'm, um, from the impression we got while we were on set a couple of days was um, um, from talking to some extras who did multiple days that they were shooting both parts the exact same time. Because mm -hmm. even when we were on scene, they wouldn't tell us which part we were in. People that read the book guessed we were in part one just because the stuff was so early in the book that we thought, well, there's only way we're in part two is if we're doing this as a flashback or some reason. We have to be in part one. But some of the other extras had already talked about filming stuff like the month before that was clearly part two That's stuff. Too. So I think they were filming it just when they were at a set, they just filmed everything they were going to film there, and then they moved on to the next set. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I think all that stuff's filmed. I mean, I mean they might be doing some special effects stuff. Um, I'm sure it's all yeah, done. Sure yeah, I'm not sure it how much. The, like, it's interesting that you said that the same casting person for uh, Fast and the Furious was on this set because the what they ended yeah. up doing with Paul Walker was using his brothers as stand-ins and then kind of shooting from the back of the head and and some tricks of the silver screen uh, to get what they needed to kind of fill out that plot line. And what I was talking about with my friends is that I wonder if um, betraying Plutarch is maybe something that they could write into uh, part two hmm. because they are very clear with Katniss that, or at least it's very clear that if, if Katniss gets played down, because in, in the second part, she's not the Mockingjay so much in the propos. She's just a soldier, and they're, they're trying to play her role down as just one of the people in the crowd because Coyne realizes that if she ever makes a play for president or if she decides that someone else wants to should be the the president of the new democracy then everyone's going to back Katniss. Whatever Katniss and so if you're if you're the enemy of coin in even just politically then you're not worth it so in the propos they try to start downplaying her role as just one of the people so that with the residual memory is that Katniss isn't that memorable so that she won't have as much political power when this is all over so that Coin can, again, come in and take the clean sweep. And uh, so I definitely think that it's possible. I don't know if, if they would do this, but if they wrote him out that way where Coin betrays Plutarch and Katniss finds out about it, that would be a good way for yeah. her to see that she's not safe under yeah. coin either. <laughs> and But, I, again, I don't know if they would really do that to Philip Seymour Hoffman's character and, like, the whole real life... Yeah, probably just depends ...implications on... of writing out a character like that, but yeah. Yeah, it's a possibility. Comes... It's... I was going to say, it probably comes down to how much they'd actually film with him, you know, like if they mm -hmm. film like 98% of the stuff, they're not going to change, they might not change it a lot, but if they'd only filmed, you know, 70%, they might change the storyline around it. Or... Right. Mm -hmm. What I was going to say earlier that I forgot, uh, I put it up on Facebook too, that I was really impressed that while The Hunger Games has never been gory with its violence, it's still very clear when people are murdered or when people are beaten or when something like that Visually, it's, it's been very clear that it's a violent place to live, a volatile place to live, and that when they go back to District 12, and at first it's all rubble, and then she goes over the hill, and there's just bodies everywhere. Yeah. And, and it's not like they're reduced to ash bodies. Like, you still see skeletons, and you can tell that they are people who just fell 
in the middle of this terrible destruction, um, that that is something, again, it's, it reflects the accuracy of the after effects of war a lot better than a lot of other films would. And I, I'm glad that they kept in those kinds of horrors because it would be too easy to wash that out and just be like, everything is rubble and ashes. Yeah. Versus, true. no, there are still bodies that are decomposing and like this this random dog is eating the dead bodies. Yeah. <laughs> that are that still did a really, really because, good job. Yeah, because it's this is a PG-13 movie, and for them to still keep those visuals in, I think that's, I'm just really proud of them for doing that, because if, if you're really thinking about the people who are seeing this movie um, in those ages, and, and the reason books like these are so important is that it's that opportunity to give you a new perspective of consequences to your actions. Um, yeah, I remember when I read the books, one well, of my first reactions is they'll never be able to do this as a movie because of all the, the violence. Yeah. And if they took the violence out, it really wouldn't work as a movie, but they definitely figured out a way to, you know, not downplay the violence, but the same way make it a PG-13 movie. Because, you they know, just, that's, they it took wouldn't the work goal. as a rated R movie. But they found the right level. Yeah. I mean, they, they took out the gore. Like, instead of a blood spray, it's a little blood spurt, and then a trickle. <laughs> true. Well, I mean, it, but it's true. Like, if you remember in the actual Hunger Games arenas, whenever someone gets stabbed with something, like, there's coloring around the wound, but there isn't, like, a full-on volcano of blood <laughs> coming out. And then whenever the peacemakers, peacemakers, peacekeepers... Peacekeeper. Yeah, peacekeepers. I think. Um, <laughs> like annihilate someone. There is a little bit of spray, but it's not like a huge. Like you, can, it's enough to tell that someone just got a shot to the head, but it's not an ex, a huge murder scene, crime scene, blood. You know, if you know what I mean, like Dexter or Bones or <laughs> something where. <laughs> Or castle, like it's definitely like it, there's enough blood there to prove what happened, but it isn't excessive. Yeah, I think the to take into a rated R film. Probably the most blood they've ever shown was actually um, uh, the scene where they whipped Gale and stuff, and then they showed his back all mm -hmm. more up. I mean, yeah. that's probably the most graphic thing they ever did in the movie. And that was even somebody that was dead, you know. Yeah. yeah, which is good. Like, it's really good that they show, they kept those visuals in to just yeah. really show how bad this stuff can be. Um, uh, one thing I was curious about, because I ended up and did not say after the credits, but the little app I used actually said there was something after the credits. Did anybody stay? To... What? Um, it was yeah. the changing of the emblem. Okay, because the reason I didn't say that, the app, you know, it'll rank in and say, like, is it worth the time? And only, like, 60% of the people said it was worth it. I was like, well, I'm not going to stay then. Um, <laughs> oh, man, I think we just lost Cat. I'm back. Sorry. It's telling me my battery is 20% left. Um, <laughs> okay, we're wrapping but, up. So it changes from this into this into um, that... Mocking Jay inside, like upright, you know, because it yeah. in the films it's upright, and then the last piece is it breaking, like in the background of this is the the thing gets broken. So it does the one, That's two, three cool. transition that we've seen, and then the final transition is still the Mocking Jay spreading wings, but then the circle bursting. Cool. And that was the very end. cool. That was it. Um, well, overall, let's maybe go through and just say, like, out of ten, what would you rate it? And then we can... Out of ten. Unless anyone has, sorry, I didn't know. I thought your battery was dying, Cat. That's why I was like... Oh, yeah, I was just going to say <laughs> another thing that I love that they did visually was the relationship between Peta and Katniss, and they were on the opposite sides of the world, but you really see uh, her reacting to his, his visual deterioration, and she's the only one who notices. Yeah. Am I gone? Yeah. 
I went we can still hear you, but we lost the camera. Oh, okay. Well, and, and as you just see him wither away, like, yeah. the longer it goes on, he just starts to look so <laughs> bruised and tortured. He's suffering from Captain America disease and uh, Bella Swan <laughs> vampire <Yeah>. disease. <laughs> and then like, in, that, in that final okay. scene where he's just skin and bones yeah. sitting in the District 13 hospital situation and you're just like, I almost don't want to see this guy right now. <laughs> I don't want to uh, see this. Tita. It's terrifying. It's terrifying. Yeah. And that whole scene was brilliant. Oh, man. Yeah, they did a good job with it. Oh, and then the whole worry of, like, because you're, you're sitting here, if you read the books, like, when are they going to cut off the movie? When are they going to cut <laughs> off the movie? When is it going to happen? And then it just goes dark for a little while, and you're like, is that it? <laughs> no, it suck. I'm glad they didn't do that. All right, that's it. That's all I had. It was a great film. I I liked, um I loved Catching Fire, like the book and the film. I thought they were just so, so good. But I really liked Mockingjay, and I know obviously it's not getting as good of reviews because it's less action-packed and there's not as much going on. Um, but comparing it to the book and then watching the movie, I'm just so excited about it. And I would I, I would give Catching Fire like a, a 9 out of 10, but I, so I'd give Mockingjay like a, a 7 to 8 out of 10. That's where I would... I would rank it. it was, yeah. I really liked it, though, a lot. Loved it. It's kind of similar. Catching Fire is probably still my favorite of the movies. Uh, Book-wise, I like the first book the best, but I would say I enjoyed Mockingjay Part 1 better than I did the first movie. So, you know, if you're ranking the movies at the moment, I'd put this as my number two in the the uh, the series, which to me is pretty good, because I did not like the third book at all. So the fact that I enjoyed the movie this much, to me, okay. spoke. You know, the director's doing a great job with it. If I had to rank it, I'd probably give it like a maybe an eight or something, because I'd probably give Catching Fire like a maybe a nine point five or something. Catching Fire to me was pretty almost perfect. So yeah, yeah, I am one of the rare oh, ones that okay. I really liked Mockingjay oh. um, as a book, but. I definitely feel that as a literal transition from page to screen, they did an amazing job with Catching Fire, and I would probably do Catching Fire as like 9.5 out of 10, and this one, because they had some more challenges to build world build, so like there's the positive side of they did some excellent world building since uh, you get to see more of than just what Katniss is going through. I would still put it at like 9 out of 10. I, I think it was brilliant. I just have some you know, personal issues with some, <laughs> some of the choices that they made, but mostly, like, I'm I'm so blown away by it, and the casting was phenomenal, and the acting was so, so, so good. good. And I think that's what really takes it above and beyond, is that these people finally have these, wear these characters like second skin. Um, and that's one nice thing about series, is that you have the opportunity, and the actors have the opportunity to grow with these characters. You saw it in Harry Potter, you saw it in all these other things. Um, and so I definitely, I'm very excited for, I'm, I'm very excited to be destroyed by part two. <laughs> I agree. I agree. So is there anything else anybody wants to chime in before we um, wrap up the show? I think I've covered everything I want to say, except for I'm probably going to go listen to The Hanging Tree like a hundred more times. So. <laughs> In order to do that, I'd have to stop listening to Blank Space. Oh my god, don't even <laughs> get me started on Taylor Swift's new album, it's so good. I'm oh, obsessed with the, yeah. the... And, and as a unfortunate bear of news, uh, my friend bought the whole Mockingjay Part 1 soundtrack, and other oh. than the One Lord song and, like, maybe one other one, the whole tone of the soundtrack is just not the same tone of the movie. Uh, Lord did that, wrote the song, the theme song, quote-unquote, yeah. but she also curated all the other songs for it, and so Lord is just too offbeat, I feel, to curate songs that match the tone of the movie because they curate the songs that match the tone of her weirdness. <laughs> I'm so, going to have to find a copy of that because... Yeah, I was going to say, go, go get the listing, like the 
the playlist off the internet and then go find the songs on YouTube and then buy selectively so you don't have to buy the whole album because my friend really regrets Weird. buying the whole album. <laughs> Uh, and she's uh, never been, and she's like a music fiend, so she buys the album soundtracks and stuff to almost everything, and this is the first one. I mean, because say what you want about Twilight, I still love Twilight. It has a special place in my heart, but those soundtracks are phenomenal. Like, the curation of the songs are so great, and so for, I was like, thank you for letting me know this before I wouldn't spend my money on the Marking J one. Yeah, that. <laughs> That's a terrible idea. We'll just give this over to Lord. Just let her handle yeah. it. <laughs> Why would anyone think that was a good idea? <laughs> yeah. I mean, she's great and everything, but mm, she's still what? And I like the old? song at the end. Yeah, I like the song she did at the end. Like oh, as yeah. the drawing. But I can't imagine her like re like doing a remix of like a re <laughs> Little thing well, in there. no, no, she curated all of the other artists that contributed to the album, oh. so she was in charge of deciding who was on oh. the soundtrack. I had no yeah. idea she had that big of a hand in it. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well. I'm like, sweetheart, she's 18, like, she's wicked talented for 18, but she's still 18. <laughs> Yikes. So, that, that was my last little Good bit to know. of stuff. I probably so, will I guess... Hang in tree, then. <laughs> All right, well, I didn't have anything else to chime in, so I guess um, if you have, you know, in your comment section below, you know, please feel free to, you know, leave any comments, feedback about the movie. Try to keep it spoiler-free just in case anybody hasn't seen it yet. Um, if you have any questions you want to ask me in the comment section below about being an extra, please feel free to do that. If you have any hopes for part two, let us know in the comment section below. Um, and I'm, we don't have another live show scheduled at the moment, but who knows, we might do one before the end of the year's out, well, maybe with the Christmas gift exchange or something like that. So um, get to work on that, if, if Holly and Kat, if you have it. Yeah. Our, uh, mine's already been sent out in the mail, so. I'm going to send mine out Friday when I get paid, so. Yeah, I, I did mine earlier this week because oh, I decided wow. I wanted to go to the post office before the post Thanksgiving craziness oh, starts. so smart. That's smart. But with that, I don't have anything else, so I guess we'll um, end it here. So um, thanks for watching. If anybody's made it one hour into the live show, <laughs> and we'll see you the next time. Thank you. Bye.